We're coming to you live from New York City, inside a packed Madison Square Garden for one of the most eagerly anticipated pay-per-view events in recent memory. Tonight, it's Miguel Cotto against Sergio Martinez for the middleweight championship of the world. Martinez has held that identity since taking it away from Kelly Pavlik four years ago, but he faces what may be his toughest test in future Hall of Famer, Cotto. And before our main event, we have a three-fight undercard, beginning with veteran Andy Lee facing John Jackson. Jackson is the son of former junior middleweight titleist Julian Jackson and may hit just as hard as did his father. After that, another fighter with power, Jorge Melendez of Puerto Rico, takes on Argentinian brawler Javier Maciel. And in our final bout before the main event, Wilfredo Vasquez Jr. faces Marvin Sansona. They've met before, with Vasquez having ended it with a left hook in the fourth round four years ago. Cotto versus Martinez is being brought to you by Cerveza Tecate, Cone Caracter, and by PlayStation. PlayStation 4, greatness awaits. Madison Square Garden, the mecca of boxing, and the world's most famous arena. And by HBO Pay-Per-View, the best in pay-per-view entertainment, brought to you by HBO. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley, soon to be joined at ringside by Max Kellerman and Roy Jones, welcoming you to this HBO pay-per-view presentation of a dream fight. Miguel Cotto, the one-time amateur star for Puerto Rico who in his professional career has won world championships at 140, 147, and 154 pounds, now moves up once again at age 33, chasing a dream to become the first Puerto Rican fighter in history to win titles in four separate weight classes. And he takes on a major obstacle. Sergio Martinez, one of the greatest stories in the sport, the one-time soccer player and bicycle racer from Argentina who didn't take up boxing until age 20, didn't come to the United States to hawk his wares until age 34, and while fighting in the 154-pound weight class, found an opportunity to fight as a middleweight, seized the middleweight championship, and has held it now for the last four years. They'll be in the main event here in Madison Square Garden later on this evening. Is the three-fight undercard, which begins right away with Andy Lee, longtime middleweight contender, moving down in weight now to 154 pounds, taking on John Jackson, one of two fighting sons of Julian Jackson from the Virgin Islands, a one-time 154-pound titleist who was one of the hardest punchers in the sport. Let's see if his son has that devastating right hand that his father flashed when he was in his prime. Here's the tale of the tape now for Andy Lee against John Jackson. You see the four-year age advantage at age 25 for Jackson. Andy Lee with a two-inch height advantage and a half-inch arm length advantage measured from the armpit to the end of the fist, and you'll remember from seeing him in the past against opponents like Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Andy Lee is a southpaw. He weighed in exactly at the weight limit of 154 pounds, and Jackson weighed in at 152. Let's go into the ring now to Michael Buffer for the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the boxing mecca, the boxing capital of the world, Madison Square Garden, New York City, New York, USA, where tonight Bob Arum's top rank incorporated, Miguel Cotto Promotions, DeBella Entertainment, and Samson Boxing are proud to present an evening of world-class professional boxing for your entertainment. All bouts sanctioned by the New York State Athletic Commission. At ringside, the three judges for this first bout will be John McKay, Kevin Morgan, and Robert Perez. And inside the ring, in charge of the action at the bell, referee Benji Estevez. And now, on the line, the vacant NABF title, 10 rounds of boxing. This is in the light middleweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing blue with yellow and white. The visual weight, 152 pounds. As a professional, 18 victories, including 15 knockouts, only one defeat. 
from St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, here is John The Rock Jackson! And across the ring, fighting out of the red corner, wearing white, green, and orange, officially weighing in at 154 pounds. His professional record, 32 victories, including 22 wins by knockout, only two defeats from Limerick, Ireland, Irish, and Lee. Clear it out, guys. Let's clear it out. Give me a second. Come on. Can you get your glove in? Okay, John Andy, you already received your pre-bout instructions. Give me a nice, clean match. Obey my commands at all times. And most importantly, protect yourself at all times. Good luck to both of you. Touch them up. Thanks, Mike. We've seen Andy Lee go from hot prospect to grizzled veteran here trying to stop from becoming an opponent, a name on another guy's record. Stay back, Andy. Andy Lee at age 29 makes a calculated decision along with his new trainer and manager, Adam Booth, to move down from 160 to 154 pounds. Still trying to use that length, the long right jab, pretty good straight left hand, excellent right hook against John Jackson, fighting at his natural weight of 154. Roy Jones, what's your initial thought about the idea of moving down to 154 after having been a career middleweight? Well, not a bad idea for him because he wasn't a such a big puncher anyway. But, you know, I want to see how he takes a punch at junior middleweight. That's the way you'll tell if it had any negative effects on him going down in weight. Uh, John Jackson, who comes from a bloodline of real good punchers, will definitely show us tonight if Andy Lee can take a punch or not. Jackson's father, Julian Jackson, was a revered right-hand puncher. What else did he have? Well, to me, he was probably the best puncher ever as a dream middleweight that I've seen. I mean, this guy was a guy that if he touched you with that right hand, it was pretty much over. I have never seen a dream middleweight with that type of punching power in my entire life. I second that. Terry Norris was having his way with Julian Jackson for about a round and a half, and Julian Jackson took him out as soon as he hit him, basically. Julian is in his son's corner tonight. And John Jackson has a record of 18 and 1 so far. His only loss was a pretty close decision to Willie Nelson, who's a pretty good fighter in his own right. He is a pretty good boxer. We saw him here earlier tonight, as a matter of fact. Willie Nelson is a guy with that shot that hurt Andy Lee. Right hand drove Andy Lee back into the ropes. Yeah, Willie Nelson, another tall southpaw, I mean, a tall right handed fighter who has very good range and probably made it very difficult for John Jackson to get close to him. The late great Emmanuel Stewart would rave about Andy Lee. He wouldn't rave about the way he took that right hand because he's down right Four. now. But Five. Lee is back up Six. after a matter of only a couple Seven. seconds. Because Eight. of the way he ran that gym, all the middleweights, he was the king of, of the Croc gym for a while. And somehow that has not translated on the highest level. Oh. Tremendous right hand shots. And I think he just John Jackson is landing. I think he just hurt John Jackson with a shot himself, though. Well, they say never hook with a hooker. The question <laughs> is, who's the hooker here? Because John Jackson was land was throwing right hooks to end the fight. Lee took a thunderous beating a couple of years ago from Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. in a fight in which he was leading on the scorecards when it was stopped while he was standing up. He has not previously been knocked down. That knocked down in the corner there, the first of his career. And that shows me that it probably wasn't the best move for him to go down to junior middleweight because he, he took this punch usually as a middleweight. <laughs> Giving up a little bit of the ability to absorb, trading it for maybe a little more power for yourself. 10-8 round for John Jackson. Right. 
He's the athlete missed with a wild loop overhead, get countered by a right hook right on the button that laid him slap out. I mean, he recovered from the punch, which was extraordinary, but these are the type things you look for when you see a guy go down in weight. His ability to absorb the punch that he once absorbed as a middleweight or a higher weight class to get his guy. Andy Box found Jackson landing more than half his power shots. 10 out of 19 in round number one. Andy Lee finds himself behind 10-8 after the first round of a fight that his new trainer manager, Adam Booth, acknowledges as a crossroads fight. His quote, Andy has to win this one to keep all his dreams alive. And he could outbox the, uh, the Jackson in this fight because he's tall, um, he's rangy. He's a guy who really doesn't depend on his power. So it's not like he's totally out of the fight. But however, when you see a guy who could dominate the crunk gym as a middleweight, why would you go to dream middleweight? If you can dominate the crunk gym, you can dominate the world. Well, except he wasn't, as it turned out, dominating the world at middle. Um, and, and to your point, Roy, that shot did not land on the chin. That landed up on the cheek, and he still went down from it. A guy who's never been dropped before went down from a, a shot on the cheekbone. Like I said, that's another testament of a guy going down to a smaller weight division who probably was better off at the weight division he was at. He took a better punch as a middleweight than he does a junior middleweight. Who, who do we see him against, Jim? Was it McEwen? When he was having a lot of trouble early and came back to score a dramatic I knockout. I believe it was Craig yeah. McEwen. Yeah. It was Craig McEwen, and it was up in uh, Connecticut uh, at the Foxwoods Casino where McEwen was beating him to the punch and landing accurately and had him in all sorts of trouble in the first six rounds and then in the last four rounds of the fight lee reeled him in and ultimately knocked him out in the tent that was the most courageous win of his career and kept things going at the time as a middleweight but as a middleweight champion i think oh i don't know if he was champion or not but when he lost as a middleweight when we saw him he was fighting against a light heavy slash cruiserweight Yes, Chavez and that, is, Jr. and that is not a good indication that you need to go down in the weight because you're not fighting a guy who's really in your weight class. You're fighting a guy who's fighting two weight classes above you. Emmanuel Stewart was heartbroken that night. He had it in his head that Andy Lee, with all of his skills and his Olympic background, was absolutely certain to beat young Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. And he took the first four rounds easily, outboxing Chavez, but Chavez was batching away landing to the body and ultimately simply broke him down well you look at his two losses one was to no brian to vera out. who as it turns out also maybe beat chavez in a lot of people's minds an underrated fighter Ooh, good action here uh, uh, john jackson is definitely the stronger puncher he has to be careful because he gives away shots trying to get shots too a lot a lot like his dad would do here, Gamble, because he feels like he's so much of a stronger punch, so much more of a puncher than his opponent. Stop at the bell. So the two losses to Vera and Chavez, who you mentioned, is a cruiserweight, really. And he's in some trouble here tonight. June 14, all action, Ruslan Provodnikov, the Siberian Rocky, makes the first title defense of his 140-pound belt against undefeated Chris Algieri. Also that night, Demetrius Andre, who has a belt at 154 pounds, takes on Englishman Brian Rose. When you go into those little moments in the corner, that's where you know you've got to be in that. You have to be the... Deep breath, Jack. Deep breath. I feel. You good? Listen. Listen, you try to catch up. He see Jackson land that beautiful right hook again, flush on the jaw of Andy Lee. This one didn't knock him down, though. But once again, it was a very flush shot. And I thought it's, that hook is what caused was causing Andy Lee a lot of problems. Round three begins. See if Andy Lee can find some way to turn things around here against young John Jackson, who has had him on the defensive in the first couple of rounds, landing clean right-hand shots. Yeah, and experience is on Andy's side. He's seen pretty much everything that he's going to see tonight, including the punching power. 
So I think experience does lie in his favor, but he has to survive long enough to make it work. Straight right hand landed again for Jackson. Roy, why do you think Andy Lee, in spite of the tutelage from Emmanuel Stewart, the length, the southpaw stance, the skills, the speed, is seems a little too easy to hit considering all those attributes? Because although you added Emmanuel Stewart to your career late, he has a long history of fighting as a European style fighter who's straight up and down, not really a lot of side-to-side -side hit movement. So you, you can teach an old dog new tricks, but it's hard to break them old habits of that new dog as well. And as you see, Andy Lee always is straight up. He never hardly bobs and weaves. He never tilts to the side off them. I mean, he's trying to do it here now, but that's, those are- It's not natural for him. No, it's not. Those are the type of things that Emmanuel Stewart would better these guys at. And without Emmanuel being around now, of course, he's gonna go back even more to his old ways. Emmanuel Stewart died in October of 2012 in the last six years of his legendary training career. No fighter, not even heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko, spent more time with Emmanuel Stewart, spent more time learning from Stewart in the gym than did Andy Lee. He lived in Emmanuel's house in Detroit. Every meal he ate there was cooked for him by Emmanuel Stewart. So he had as deep a background with Stewart as almost any fighter could play. He just hit John Jackson with two good shots. May have been the best two shots he caught Jackson with all night. Once again gets tagged by the right hand, however. Jackson looking very confident after having accomplished what he did in the first couple of rounds. Like I said, he reminds you of his father so much here, whereas they're not concerned about what you hit them with. Their only concern is what they can put on your face. And that's how Jackson's looking right now. He hails from St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. And part of the thrill for him tonight is he's fighting in the house that Emil Griffith built. That's the way the Virgin Islanders like to think of Madison Square Garden. And how many amazing nights did Emil Griffith have in this ring? Hmm. Good body shot by Jackson. Lee manages to pop back up and hit him with a straight right hand. And Lee is a really good fighter, a good technical fighter. You can't take much from him. I just hated Stop to see him ball. vacate the middleweight division because I feel like that still was his best division. Here's a look at the arrival of Miguel Cotto. You can see the time at which it took place over an hour ago. Since that time, Cotto and his wife, Melissa, who you see there, came to ringside and sat at ringside in one of the front two rows to watch Felix Verdejo appear on the undercard against a hopelessly outclassed opponent. It's been a Cotto custom throughout his career to come to ringside and sit and absorb some of the atmosphere and sometimes talk to fans and media before going to the dressing room to prepare for the fight. It was something that I used to love to do, Jim, because it got you familiar with the ring, familiar with the audience, made you really realize what you were in store for, and gave you the initiative to want to come out and even do more to satisfy these people. So Miguel Cotto's done it throughout his career. Roy Jones used to do it. Fellow named Muhammad Ali used to do it back in the 1960s and 70s. Stay back, stay back, stay back. Power shots through round three by CompuBach count. Andy Lee's landing 50% of his power shots. 22 out of 44, that's good. However, John Jackson is landing 50% of his power shots. 33 out of 65. For Lee, that's bad. Harold, how do you have it through three? Okay, Jim, I got it 30 to 26, three rounds to nothing, John Jackson. You know, Jim, it's very interesting. He comes out right-handed, like you see it now, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of the round, he switches. I mean, the guy switches back and forth beautifully. Just, you know, when he goes southpaw, he lands that right hook and that right jab, and when he, uh, you know, goes right, he still lands the right hand. So, tremendous right hand power puncher. Let's give him an extra point for the knockdown in round one. Three to nothing. 30 to 26, Sean Jackson. So unofficially, according to Harold Letterman, Andy Lee in a big hole here, fighting in a fight that Adam Booth, his manager and trainer, has identified as a clear crossroads for him. And the only thing John Jackson has to do is be sure that he doesn't run into one of Andy Lee's oh, shots because he's stalking him so hard. Sometimes when you stalk a guy so hard, you almost forget about defense. And like I said before, 
a lot like his dad, they're more interested in what they can put on your face and not really worried about what you can put on theirs. Watch your heads in there. And Jackson is also throwing some pretty good body shots as well, Jim. Roy, you briefly passed through the 154-pound weight class on your way to greater prominence as a middleweight and a light heavyweight. Any thought of ever fighting John, uh, Julian Jackson? Yeah, I did have thoughts of fighting Julian Jackson. I thought we were going to be on a, a crossroad collision, and then, lo and behold, Gerald McClellan upset him. And that was at a, as a middleweight. Your friend, Gerald McClellan. Yep. So far, Andy Lee hasn't found any really vivid turnkey for changing the progress of this fight. But if he falls behind in the first half of the fight, comes back to win it, there is precedent, which was his victory over Craig McEwen in Connecticut a couple of years ago. That was Not a, looking good here, though, as Jackson just clocked him again. That was a superb straight right lead by Jackson. You cannot allow nobody last name Jackson from the Virgin Islands to hit you with clean shots like that. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, it's it's the most time-honored weapon for conventional fighters against southpaws is to throw the straight right-hand lead. Here's Lee, an about. extremely experienced southpaw, getting hit flush with Jackson's right-hand leads as though he's never seen them. I mean, I just don't understand it. But as a middleweight, like I said, I don't think Lee would have got caught with these shots. And just a few minutes ago, Sergio Martinez arriving at the arena fully one hour and seven minutes after Miguel Cotto's arrival. Martinez fighting for the first time in 14 months and coming off of surgeries on both his right knee and his right shoulder, as well as having allowed a broken left hand to heal. The left hand was broken in each of his last two fights. The right knee was torn up in each of his last two fights. The shoulder was something new after the last battle against Martin Murray. But of course, many, many ringside experts point out that much of Miguel Cotto's chance against Sergio Martinez tonight lies with the question of whether Martinez's body can hold up under the pressure. Round five of a scheduled 10. Andy Lee against John Jackson, and you can see that on Harold Letterman's unofficial card, Jackson has won every round. Knocked Lee down with a right hand in the first round. John Jackson up to that point in the fight, and Lee still had an arrow in the quiver. What an amazing comeback knockout for Andy Lee. And he rescues his career once again. Yes, he does. Promoter Lou DiBella ecstatic as he reaches over the top of people to hug his fighter. Five minutes ago, you wouldn't have given a plug nickel for Lee's chances of remaining a significant fighter in the sport. But this is the theater of the unexpected, and this is what one hard shot can do. Here's the replay. Here you see he caught him with the uppercut. He thought for sure you had him. He's wounded. He hit him with the right hand. He thinks Andy is dead right here, so he's just letting go the defense. 
and he's all out on offense, never even thinking that Andy still has the power to come back. Andy, with the big heart that he has, exchanges a right hook for overhand right, and down goes Jackson. And Benji Estevez didn't bother was it with a count as Jackson lay face down, twitching on the canvas in an awkward position with his right arm under his body. Yeah, because Jackson never suspected that Andy was going to counter like that. It's almost like when Marquez hit Pacquiao. He was so much on the attack that he had no idea that the guy was going to fire back in the midst of his attack. Perfect comparison, Roy. This was an even more extreme version because, of course, Lee was much more badly hurt than Marquez had seemed to be at that moment. And Jackson was be be being even more aggressive than Pacquiao was exactly. at that moment. Jackson was ahead on the scorecards. Lee gets the knockout victory. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the particulars on the KO. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here at Madison Square Garden, the end of this contest comes at one minute, seven seconds of round number five. The winner by knockout victory, Irish Andy Lee. Second loss for young John Jackson. You love the sportsmanship as the two of them share with each other after the amazing turn of events that took place at the end of the fifth round. We'll take a look at final CompuBox numbers through four plus rounds. Lee landing 41 of 106. Jackson landing 19 more throwing 20 more, landing at a significantly higher percentage. Power shot category, Jackson landing nearly twice as many, throwing 41 more, landing 51% of his power shots. Every once in a while, a guy lands more than half his power shots and loses the fight. Jackson showed you how to do it. Throw caution to the wind, leave yourself unguarded, get hit with a perfect counter shot. Right on the foot. A beautiful evening here in New York City. Still to come tonight, Puerto Rican knockout artist Jorge Melendez. The 26 KOs among his 28 wins. Faces man always looking to fight Javier Maciel. Then Wilfredo Vasquez Jr., son of the three-time champ, takes on Marvin Sonsona, who was once called by a Manila newspaper the next Manny Pacquiao. And then our main event, Puerto Rican superstar Miguel Cotto moving up to middleweight to face the longtime reigning champion Sergio Martinez. But first, Let's look ahead to what's upcoming from HBO Boxing. HBO Boxing stays in New York for another week with a great card across the East River in Brooklyn, June 14, featuring the return of the Siberian Rocky, Ruslan Provodnikov. Body shot, big hammers upstairs, phenomenal stuff. Provodnikov's 140-pound belt will be on the line against the undefeated Chris Algieri. Two weeks later on June 28th, Boxing After Dark is back with the Battle of Unbeatens as Terrence Crawford returns to the ring in his hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. He's got a meanness in him. And he can punch. Crawford faces off against the dangerous Yuri Orcas Gamboa for a lightweight championship. July 26th from Madison Square Garden, it's the return of Triple G, Gennady Golovkin. There it is. Cossack Thunder. What we just saw was not ordinary. It was extraordinary. One of the sport's most feared fighters will put his middleweight title and undefeated record on the line against hard-charging Australian Daniel Gill. Also that night, an intriguing matchup in boxing's glamour division as undefeated American heavyweight Bryant Jennings takes on fellow unbeaten Mike Perez. Jennings closed the show. People like heavyweight knockouts. It's a great lineup of action for HBO Boxing. For more information about the schedule and the fighters, go to HBO.com. Rated T for T. Touch 